So Cynthia, um, unfortunately, it's not giving me the option to live stream tonight. So we're recording, of course, uh, and we'll post to uh, we'll post to both Facebook and and uh, YouTube. But for some reason, it's okay. not the option. Okay, no problem. Just get your blanket. How many people are we expecting, Jeremy? Do we have any idea? I'm not sure. I didn't look at the reservations today. Okay, because I know it was postponed from the last uh, one. It wasn't. It wasn't uh, an extensive list the last time. Yeah. Um, so my watch has two minutes too, but my computer has six. So I'm going to open the webinar so attendees could join as well. Okay. Hey, what did I do here? And as of five minutes ago, our presenter said she received the link, so we should see her any moment, I would, I would assume. Okay, great. As soon as she comes, we could start. When you're ready to start the meeting, just ask me to call roll. Okay, I'm just gonna wait for her to come to make yeah. sure she's on. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as she comes on, then we can There's no meeting. Exactly. <laughs> so we'll give her, I guess, you know, a few minutes to get on. Hello, everyone. We're just waiting for the presenter to join us. Okay. My watch doesn't even have six yet, so. Yeah. No, another minute. But I am just making a mess tonight here. Don't ask me why.
Folks, if you're just joining us, we are waiting on our presenter. Okay. And we have our presenter. Great. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Yes, yes. Hi, Tessa. How Great. are you? Thank you Hi. for joining us. Of course. OK. OK, Jeremy, we could begin. We could do a roll call. Thank you. Good evening, folks. I'm going to mute everybody. Um, when I call your name, uh, please unmute yourself and acknowledge your uh, attendance tonight and then mute yourself again. Um, if you are not a member of the committee, but you are a board member, I am not going to call your name, but I will acknowledge you um, uh, in some fashion during the meeting. I'm writing your name down now. <clears throat> Pardon me. Cynthia Felix. Here. Thank you. Anthony Giulio. I see Anthony's trying to connect uh, with the audio right now. Uh, Joan Body. Here. Here. Thank you. Denny Chen. Here. Thank you. Ken Fung. John Garcia, Hector Gonzalez. I see Hector is here. Uh, our versions of Zoom do not communicate with each other. Zach Jassy, John Johnston. Uh, here. Danielle Lai. Barbara Lee. Here. Jimmy Lee. Paul Mack. Here. Sam Sierra. Okay, Cynthia, all yours. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Today we're going to hear from the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence. As you all know, stress, the disruption of social and protective networks, loss of income and decreased access to services can all exasperate the risk of violence, especially for women. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, data reports from those on the front line have shown that types of violence against women and girls, particularly domestic violence has intensified. This was because many reasons, as you know, we were required to stay at home and the risk of intimate partner violence did increase. In addition, the access to sexual and reproductive health centers became more limited and other services that they were used to such as hotlines, crisis centers, shelters, legal aid and protection services were reduced, making it difficult for women to access the few resources of help that usually were available to them. Today, Tessa, and forgive me if I mispronounce your last name, Arza Queta, who is from the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, is going to speak to us about that and talk about the services they provide. They provide free services for victims and survivors of intimate partner violence, elder abuse, sex trafficking, and gender-based uh, violence. Thank you, Tessa, for being with us tonight, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm excited to be here because as maybe the barriers to accessing services have increased, um, there's there's still a lot of help out there. So actually, hotlines have not been reduced. They've been operating the whole time. The only thing that's really happened right now is physical locations, walk-in centers, drop-in centers. Some of those have closed. Um, but some services in response have expanded. Um, 
which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, I'm gonna, I have a PowerPoint presentation, so if it's okay with everybody, I'm, I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna zip through it quickly because I would, what I would really like to do is spend most of the time on questions and answers and really talking with you all about any ideas you have about potentially bringing more awareness, more resources, more capacity building around this to your communities. We just wanna make sure you all know we're here, we're a service to you. Um, and that's that. So I'll start with an introduction. Uh, my name is Tisa and I use she, her pronouns. I'm the director of outreach at the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence. And I should probably start sharing my screen so that I can explain a little bit more about who we are. All right. Um, can somebody give me just a thumbs up if you can see that okay? Perfect, thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> All right. So um, we were established in 2001 through a voter mandate. So we've been around a long time. We've had a, two different names. We just rebranded two years ago and expanded the scope of our mission. Um, now we're known uh, as End GBV for short because our full name is quite a mouthful. Um, but in a nutshell, we work on policies and programs, of course, training and prevention education. We do a lot of research and evaluation. And by the way, all these reports that we put out are available on our website. I can share out a link in the chat once I stop sharing my screen. But um, those reports are broken down by a community board in some of them. So it'll show you the amount of domestic violence related crime being, being reported in your local community board if you're curious about that. But keep in mind that that number only represents the number of people calling 911 about domestic violence. It's not a, a picture of what's actually happening. Um, my team conducts community outreach. But the most important thing I wanna talk about are the New York City Family Justice Centers, which are free confidential locations where victims and survivors can get all kinds of help uh, dealing with gender-based violence. Now those centers are currently physically closed, except for one, the Manhattan Center is open several days a week for people who are not able to access services telephonically or virtually. Um, and we are looking to open other centers as the COVID rates continue to drop. Um, but, you know, there are still other in-person services available on the local level, which we can talk about later. Um, and of course, we collaborate. Um, I'm not going to do the full training, so pardon me if I'm sort of zipping through, but um, has anyone, and you know, feel free to engage with me, take yourself off of mute if you like, or put it in the chat, but has anyone here um, heard of gender-based violence and do they know what is encompassed in gender-based violence? Yes, yes I, do. I do. Okay, tell me. Okay, my, my name is Barbara and, and um, there's, there's this really beautiful, beautiful woman, woman named Marsha um, P. Johnson who transitioned and um, she was beaten up by the by peers. Peer. And I also have friends who have transitioned and they've been a victim of not just um, physical violence, but also verbal and emotional violence. Right, thank you, Barbara. Um, so it, so it, it can be a lot. So gender-based violence encompasses a lot of different forms of oppression and violence and abuse, and it can take many forms. And I think that's what Barbara's comment kind of hit on, right? It can be physical, it can be verbal, it can be financial. People can use systems against you, for example, immigration services or, um, you know, ACS, making threats to have your children removed or make false allegations, right? I mean, if you're a person of quote, color, quite frankly, you know, um, NYPD can be used as a form of abuse, right? Um, so having said that, um, I think what's important about what Barbara pointed out is that gender-based violence includes a lot of different um, categories and it can be a lot of different, for like the, the form in which they use to, to exact control over someone can be very different. So um, Barbara also mentioned uh, someone in particular, Marsha P. Johnson, who was a trans woman and a woman of color. Um, so I want to call attention to this particular sentence in the middle. You know, gender-based violence is basically an umbrella term, and it encompasses a lot. 
but it can also uh, play off of what expected gender norms are and role expectations and the way a society views and defines those things. Um, it's really the exploitation of power imbalances and inequities. Um, it can impact anyone. And these are the categories it includes. I'll, I'll skip to the next slide. Um, so gender-based violence is in the middle, and that is the umbrella term, and all those petals around it are what are sort of like the subcategories under gender-based violence. So it is sexual violence, and I should really mention that April is Sexual Violence Awareness Month. There's a lot of activities going on this month around the city trainings, around rape culture and sexual violence and prevention, um, and those are all on our websites and Instagram, and there's a really great organization you can follow called Denim Day, um, which I can talk about as well. Um, human trafficking, and I'm not just talking about commercial sexual exploitation uh, or prostitution. I'm also talk about I'm also talking about labor trafficking. Um, those are considered forms of gender-based violence. Stalking, um, stalking is a behavior that is highly associated with domestic violence, homicide, and violence. Um, it is the number one reported behavior prior to a domestic violence homicide. So we include stalking in our definition as well. Family violence, intimate partner violence, of course, also goes by the name of domestic violence, elder abuse, sexual harassment, those are all forms of gender-based violence. And so when I am talking about GBV or gender-based violence, this is sort of everything I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, I also talk really fast, so please feel free to interrupt me um, if anyone has any questions or concerns. Um, so these are just the definitions. These are all on our website. So if and, and I can share these slides afterward. So if any of this is going too fast, you're not going to be tested on it. And I'm going to let you know where you can find all of this information later. Um, but when we say elder abuse, what we're really talking about is any type of abuse of a person 60 or over. It can be by a caretaker, by an adult child, a neighbor, an intimate partner, a partner, right? Um, sexual violence is really any form of violence uh, that results in the loss or removal of someone's sexual autonomy, okay? And that can happen in a lot of different ways. Um, non-consensual sex, it could be non-consensual pornography, uh, drug facilitated sexual acts, uh, things like that. Um, stalking, I talked about, we call that a pattern of harassing behavior. It's really behavior that's meant to make someone really fearful. Human trafficking, um, that definition includes the control, force, defrauding, co coercing someone into engaging in labor services. And again, that can include commercial sexual exploitation. Um, the only thing I would note here with human trafficking is when a person is under the age of 18, you do not have to have force um, when it comes to commercial sexual exploitation um, because in the way that the law views it, somebody under 18, does not have um, consent to give to engage with commercial sex work uh, or sexual exploitation. Domestic violence involves intimate relationships in whatever that means, boyfriend, girlfriend, we're dating, we dated once, we're married, we're divorced, you know, that, that is my intimate partner, whatever that is. Um, and again, within, within all of these categories, the form of the abuse could change. Um, these are all just types of gender-based violence. Uh, family violence, which occurs between like siblings, parents, family members, um, people in the same household, et cetera. All right. Um, so at the base of gender-based violence, we talk a lot about power and control. Really, that is um, how, this is sort of the gas that drives the machine of gender-based violence. Um, and again, as Barbara said, it could be physical, it could be you know, emotional, but really these are all the different forms or tactics that abuse, these are the different forms abuse can take, or to say it another way, for the abuser or the person who is causing harm, these are all the different tactics that they might use. They may not use all of them. They may use one of them. 
They may change over time, um, but these are based on a lot of different things. Our environment, our accesses to resources, our status in a certain society, the color of our skin, our gender, uh, certain expectations in our communities, right? Like there's so many things um, that intersect and impact people's experiences or how they choose to abuse someone. So it can be financial um, and there's a bunch of different ways there that can happen. It can be emotional. Does anybody know what gaslighting is? That, that's a new term that's getting a lot of play. I wanna make sure everybody knows what that is. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So um, I don't know, Barbara, if you have a better example, but gaslighting is basically in trying to make someone think that they're going crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Cynthia, you wanted to add? Yeah, I just want to say, um, you know, it's when you tell someone, you make them believe what you think about them. So I could tell you you're worthless and I keep saying that to you and saying it to you and saying it to you until you eventually believe the person because they keep saying it to you. So that's kind of like gaslighting. It makes you feel yeah. confused because you begin to believe what's being said about you, even though you know it's not true. Yeah. So you begin be to believe you. it's true, actually. Eventually you begin to believe it. Right. It could be about you or it could be about something even trivial just to make you question your own reality. So just for example, let's say, you know, um, I come home and my part, my abusive partner's like, you left the gas on all day. You left the stove on. Did you realize that you could have burnt, you could have blew up the house. And I'm like, no, I, I could have swore I shut it off. I never do that. And then the next day they do it again. And now they're just really, what they're trying to do is give me a complex right? That I can't be trusted with the stove when really I, I didn't do it. So it can take a lot of different forms. It could be telling you, right? Like you're never going to find a minute. So it could be really doing something to question your own reality and whatever that looks like, the way you value yourself, what people think of you, how you operate in the world. Um, we talked a lot about stalking. So showing up unannounced, uh, unwanted contact, monitoring or tracking someone, spreading rumors about them. The other thing I would say, I, I think digital and technological abuse is really important to note here especially during the pandemic we've all been living in our phones right i mean in our computers and our phones this is really like the only way those of us who have who have access to them this is really the only way we've had to connect to the outside world while we've been in shutdown or on pause as they like to say so we're increasing the ways we use our technology and that is thereby increasing the ways a, a harmful people or people who cause harm, abusers might be able to uh, exert power and control. So they could be monitoring your devices. Uh, there's a lot of malware and apps um, that can be used maliciously to track your whereabouts to, um, you know, they can copy your phone so that every text and phone call that you get, they're getting on a dummy phone, or they can make it so that when they call you, it looks like your mother or your friend is calling you instead of your abusive partner who's not supposed to be contacting you. Right? There's really a lot of ways um, that technological abuse has not only been um, sort of expanding over the years as we become more dependent on smartphones and technology and apps and all these social media networks, right? But especially during the pandemic. Um, and we have lots of resources around that too. Um, of course, uh, when it comes to sexual abuse, it could be sort of the more straightforward things we think about, but also, you know, shaming someone um, about their bodies or, you know, their gender identity or, you know, their sexual orientation, anything. Um, there's really, if someone really wants to cause you harm, there's really lots of ways they can figure out how to do that. I also wanna talk about barriers um, because during this pandemic, there's been a lot of barriers to seeking help, right? Like physically being able to walk into a space and say, hey, I need help. Um, that's been really confounded by the fact that we can't go places. Um, but, you know, it's, Getting help, although there are a lot of resources people can use, getting help is not easy. And I think if you are someone who is experiencing this, or if you are a bystander or um, someone uh, who knows someone who's experiencing this, and you're thinking like, why don't they just get help, right? Think about some of these reasons, because I think if you keep this in mind with you, then you will be a better listener and a better helper and a better supporter to that person. Excuse me, statistics show. Sorry, water break. Um, that uh, 
It takes the average domestic violence victim seven attempts to successfully leave an abusive relationship. I want to preface that, that well, I didn't preface it, but I want to, I want to say that um, that's for people who choose to leave abusive relationships. A lot of people never leave abusive relationships and that is their choice. And um, there's a lot of services for people who are in that position as well. But for those who do want to leave, um, it can be very difficult, right? Um, where are you going to sleep? How are you going to pay your bills? Is your partner going to be able to find you? Have they been threatening you that when you leave, they're going to hurt you or the people that you love? Um, you know, are you a documented are you are you a documented citizen here? Like, do you even have paperwork to be here? Are you afraid that your partner has, you know, might turn you in or do they are they holding on to your identification documents as a form of control? Um, do you have children? Right. Do the children go to school? Do they have clothes? Are they going to have a place to stay? There's so many things that go into someone's plan and, and someone's safety. Um, you know, it could have been blackmail. They could have been told by their partner, uh, if you leave, I'm going to share some sort of secret about you that you don't want out there or, um, you know, whatever it might be. So I think it's important for people to remember it's not just as easy as saying, why don't you leave or, you know, you should get help. There's a lot of help. Out there. Yes, there is a lot of help out there, but um, I would say give the people you know who are experiencing abuse the autonomy to choose what sort of help they want to access, what they need right now. I mean, I might think they need something different than they want now, um, but we have to respect those choices and sort of guide them to the right help that they want. Um, the best thing you can do as a listener is to believe and listen, to validate their feelings and acknowledge their strength. It was probably very difficult for them to share that they were experiencing this abuse. Um, offering support, what do you need? And I would, I would stress realistic support. You don't want to put yourself in harm's way um, or make promises that you can't keep to this person. Um, but, you know, what do you need from me is a good start. They might just want someone to listen to. And then from there it can go to, well, do you have a phone number I can call? Or, you know, do you know where I can go for help? Um, and asking them what they can, what you could do to help them feel safer. And now the most important part, knowing about resources, because there are quite a bit. So I talked about the family justice centers. We, the family justice center model is practiced internationally, but New York City is probably the only city in the world that has five family justice centers because we have so many people. So there's one center located in every borough. Before COVID, they were walk-in centers. You could go Monday through Friday, nine to five, and walk in and get free, confidential, comprehensive services. Um, you can pick and choose which services you want. They're client-centered, so nobody tells you what you have to do. They're, somebody walks in, they get screened, and then they're going to be given an option, options of everything that's available to them, and they can pick and choose what they want. I should stress that we are co-located with the district attorney's offices. Um, we also have two domestic violence police officers on site at every center. But again, people do not have to engage with any services they don't want to, and that includes law enforcement. If they're not ready to engage with law enforcement, they do not have to. But if they want to, they're there, and it makes the process a little easier for them. Um, the way these centers work is that we contract with partners and bring all the services on site into one location. So if there was not a family justice center, a victim or survivor would have to go one place to get an order of protection, somewhere else to get counseling services, somewhere else to see about emergency shelter, somewhere else to find out about like maybe trauma health care or whatever. Um, and, and so what the family justice center does is remove the barriers by putting them all in one place. Okay. There are so many centers on site at these centers that I don't have time to go through all of them, but the really beautiful things happen there. Everything from crisis, immediate crisis needs to long-term healing and well-being. So somebody, uh, we can treat every, we can provide support to everyone, people who are in the abuse right now experiencing it all the way to people who maybe no longer are in the abusive situation, but are still dealing with the recovery and are still trying trying to heal holistically. They maybe they still have credit problems because their abusive partner ruined their credit. Uh, maybe they need access to attorneys. Maybe they are engaging with law enforcement and want help. You know, navigating the DA's office or working with the DA's office or um, you know all that stuff. Immigration legal services. We have children's services. We have yoga for survivors and their children. Transcendental meditation for survivors and their children. And everything is free always. 
Um, normally they're walk-in centers, um, but right now, uh, as I said, the centers are temporarily closed except for the Manhattan Center here. We opened the center a couple months ago because we knew that some people were not gonna be able to access us telephonically or online. Uh, and as soon it was, as it was safe to do so, the reason we opened the Manhattan Center is because it's our largest facility. And so we were able to open that center safely making sure social distancing, we're only open at about, I think 25 to 30% capacity. It's by appointment only. That way we can ensure people's safety from COVID um, in order to get these, they, and it is only open by appointment. So they would have to call any one of these centers. And if you say you need in-person services, they'll make an appointment at your convenience. So you can come into a physical space to access services. Um, hopefully, if the COVID rates continue to stay steady and or go down, the Staten Island Center will be the next to open. I know you all are in Brooklyn. Um, you should know if you has anyone been to the Brooklyn Family Justice Center? If not, when we open back up and it's safe to do so, if you ever want a tour and you want to meet your Brooklyn team, I'm more than happy to set that up for you. But our Brooklyn Center is our oldest center. It was the first center we had in the city and it's the smallest. Um, so it's going to take a while before we can sort of navigate that space safely during these COVID times. But as soon as we're able to reopen, we will. But again, all these centers are open, are, are still operating telephonically Monday through Friday, nine to five. If those time frames don't work, I'm going to talk about a few other resources. I feel like I'm taking a lot of time, so I'm going to skip through this. This is just all of the services, and this doesn't even encapture all of the services that are offered at our centers. But as you can see, it's a lot. Psychiatric services, I didn't even talk about the financial literacy. We do computer classes, language classes. Um, we do all sorts of family programming to give families time, uh, victims and their children time to bond in a safe space uh, for healing, all sorts of advocacy, shelter and housing, access to benefits, please excuse my partner, work from home, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and um, here are some hotlines. So this hotline right here, 621 Hope, this operates 24 seven. So if you do not wanna call police and you can't, you can't get to the phone Monday through Friday, nine to five to call one of us, one of our centers, you can call this Hope Line 24 seven in any language and they will connect you to services. Um, and that's a good alternative. Now, if you're in an emergency, like you're in a crisis, you're in danger, and or you want to report a crime, then you're gonna wanna call or text 911, right? None, none, there is no, unfortunately our, our society, our system is, that's the only means that our society has to support in order to keep you safe if you're in immediate danger, right? So um, a lot of people don't know that during the pandemic, 911 launched a text capability. Um, I believe they're still building out the infrastructure. Um, so they haven't advertised extremely widely, right? Because they wanna make sure everything, but it's working, it's up and running. So if people cannot like talk because their partner is next to them, they can text. They can text 911 for help if they want. Um, there's some youth specific resources here as well. Uh, we Here in New York City, we have a really great partner to Day One, they're called. I would recommend them, dayone.org. Um, they work specifically with youth and teen dating violence and gender-based violence. Um, let's keep going here. These are just some general non-DV services that we like to share as well. So NYC Well is the city's mental health support hotline. Um, here's the state one. And then of course the National Suicide Prevention Line we always share. Uh, Love is Respect is a really great organization to get materials related to youth and teen dating violence. Um, these providers down here, LGBTQ friendly, um, and actually not friendly is the right word, representative. They, the, uh, the, the AVP, we call it for short, the Anti-Violence Project. It's a wonderful organization that does work in the LGBTQIA community. This is us. So this is our online portal. Now, if someone cannot text, 
They can't call. Maybe their partner's monitoring their phones. Um, they can't walk into a center, um, but maybe they can browse around on a computer. Maybe they have access to that and they know how to safely delete their history. Then they can go to this directory right here and they can search around what's in their local community. They can search around by specialty. For example, maybe they, I, they maybe they're Muslim and they want to work with somebody who has expertise in working with Muslim survivors who are experiencing gender-based violence. They can search for that, right? Uh, maybe they want to work with some, maybe they identify as transgender and they really want an organization that understands um, their experiences and they want to find an organization that has expertise working with that. Maybe it's a language thing. Maybe they know they want to work with an organization who speaks their language. Um, people can search that in this in this directory. Um, and the directory also has the Google Translate function so they can translate the website into whatever language that they want. Um, this website, this directory, NYC Hope, also has an escape button. So let's say somebody is in the vicinity of an abusive partner and they are on this website searching around, there's a button at the top they can easily click that'll exit out. That way their screen won't be visible. It won't be visible to someone what they were searching, right? So there's some safety measures built into to this particular resource and others um, just to increase safety. And that's me. Um, I'm going to leave this up for a quick second and then I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, I would love to talk with you all about this was really mainly about understanding the issue and the resources, but I, I want to let you all know that we collaborate with communities all the time we do workshops we bring free workshops for community members, all sorts of resource events. Um, so if you all have any events or any ideas on how we can engage with your community members and you know bring this sorts of activity we also do a lot of art based um, activities. Uh, that's a great way to get people to engage with the subject because not everybody wants to go to a domestic violence workshop. <laughs> so um, just please keep my information and um, I'll stop sharing my screen so we can engage in a little conversation or questions. Would you also share the presentation with us uh, so that yes. we can uh, send it out to our board members and others? Absolutely. So right after this, I will turn it into a PDF and, and share it with you. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I also want to share some statistics for the board members and the committee members on Community Board 7. Thank you. I looked at the workshop at your website. It was great. It had a lot of information. So I looked at Community Board 7 and I saw that for family related reports, there was about 505 of them last year in 2019, which is 34% of all um, calls that were made and 31 of them were considered felony assaults. And then for intimate partner was about 66% and 959. And of those 70 were intimate uh, felony assaults. So I had a question. I also noted that there were some new resources that were being put up um, that said they would work with communities that were most impacted. And I did notice that we're not the most impacted, but let's say a neighboring a community is and those surveys that were done, would it still come to Community Board 7? So for example, I noticed Community Board 5 was one of the highest rates. And I'm going to assume that they would get extra services because of that. I read that there was going to be a survey. So how did that come to CB7? Do you know about that? So I am more than happy to check in with my, my data team and ask them specifics about that survey. So to be and only because we've released a lot of surveys and, and I want to make sure I know the specific one you're talking about. Um, so, for example, our data team uh, is doing a survey right now for survivors because they want to hear from survivors about their specific experiences during COVID um, and, and around racial equity and, you know. And so that is just a general survey that anyone can answer citywide. But as far as the most impacted areas, let me check in with our research team so I can get the specifics about that. Yes, and, and find and out. Thank you. And it was said it was uh, from a news release. It said that it's going to focus on expanding family violence prevention and intervention with new community-based resources because I think a lot of times they may not know the signs, right? They may be experiencing this. Is that um that's a lot of times I see that they don't realize that they are being abused, maybe culturally or some other things, you know, they may not even realize that this could be, they could get help and could be supported because this is not a normal thing. 
Um, so first of all, what I say, what I want to say is, dis despite the rollout of any new services, we are available to you regardless. So if if the if the interest is there and the collaboration, the partnership is there, we will work with anyone. Uh, we would love to engage more. What in whatever way you think is most meaningful to your community? Is it an art based project? Is it you know a community workshop or training? Is it a town hall? Is it a Q and A? Whatever it is, is it a youth event? Um, you know we're down to work with you. Whatever. When it comes to increasing services, um, so there's a there's a bunch of stuff coming down the pipeline and. Uh, Number one is there is a set of proposals also on the NYPD website right now. It's around the police reform and a lot of, uh, there's a big section or a chunk of those that are specifically DV related. And so as a result of those, there is gonna be more money coming to family violence programs, et cetera. Um, that might be what you're talking about, but I'm not sure if that's based on a specific yeah. survey. There's another thing I actually want to want to let you all in on that's really, I think it's exciting, I think it's important, and I think more people should know that it's coming. It's actually in the process of being built right now. Um, and that is services for people who cause harm. So, you know, uh, New York is really sort of taking the stance that it's not enough just to work with victims or people who have experienced violence. If we really want to move the needle on gender-based violence, we have to work with people who cause harm. So the RFPs and the contracts are, are being finalized, the contracts I should say are being finalized, the programs are building these, these are structuring these programs right now, but there are two forms of programs rolling out in the next year for abusive partners. We call them APIPs for short, APIP, Abusive Partner Intervention Programs. Some of them will be court mandated and some of them will be restorative justice based and in community and voluntary. Meaning people who cause harm, abusive partners have to want to change, want to engage and they can just walk into these places and get help for their, their behaviors, their, for, for causing harm. Um, and so those are also rolling out. I just wanted to, let people know that because that is a really new approach um, that the city's taking and that's going to be it's part of the expansion of services in this area. But um, Ms. Cynthia, I realize I didn't really answer your question, but I'm going to get more information about how that particular survey was done, if the survey is complete, if there are any opportunities for you all to participate. But that aside, again, survey aside, whatever services you might need, be in need of, whatever ways you're interested in engaging, let me know. Um, because we do that sort of troubleshooting, right? Like if you've identified some sort of service gap in your community, we're happy to talk to all of the partners in the city and find out if there's some workaround we can we can do to resolve that. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Of Are there any questions from any of the board members or any of the committee members? Board or members, please raise, please raise your hands. I see uh, Cindy. Cynthia, while, while we have a moment, let me just acknowledge that I've also noted uh, Beverly Kleiman, Cynthia Vandenbosch, Cynthia Gonzalez, David Estrada, Gladys Bruno, Karen Rolnick, Pat Ruiz, and Victor Swinton. And there's one hand up. I'm not sure if you can see that. Yes, I see it. Cindy, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for hosting um, this meeting and um, this topic is in, incredibly important. Um, I, I actually, I have a question about, I, I chair our accessibility uh, committee. And I know that um, in terms of domestic violence that people with disabilities tend to be especially vulnerable. Um, and um, with situations of domestic violence and also, you know, in some cases they're reports by uh, victims of people who have disabilities, um, they might not be responded to in the same way or understood in the same way. And I'm just wondering, um, I have, I guess, a few questions. Is there anything that you could share about like resources specific to that population or does your agency kind of collaborate with MOPD in any way? Um, or do you do education that sort of intersects with the unique challenges that people with disabilities might face? And then the other question has to do with uh, communication access, where if you have someone who has significant hearing loss or has is deaf and they step, they they need support with um, through through they need the resources that you have to offer. Um, would you be able to facilitate? support so that they would be able to get the services they need? In a word, yes. 
to all of it. <laughs> we're actually, it's funny. Um, so I'm based out of headquarters and we're neighbors on the same floor with MOPD. So we, yeah, we, we, um, we actually take their trainings regularly specifically to help continue our capacity building around increasing access to services. All of our centers are accessible. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, we have access to uh, ASL interpreters. Um, we also, we also work with organizations who have specialty in working with people who have disabilities. Um, for example, Barrier Free Living is one particular DV organization that has accessible shelters, for example, right? Um, and works specifically with people experiencing GBV who have disabilities. So yeah, yes, yes to all of that. Um, I'm trying to remember everything that you, yeah, I think, I, I think that's how I would categorize all of that. Yes, but, um, yeah, I, I think that's something that we constantly strive to to stay aware of and work around and, and you know, within our partners. And I think the, the thing to the thing, the important thing to remember is like the city itself does not provide direct services. What we do is we contract with a really beautiful array, like New York City is because I, I, I grew up in Tucson, Arizona, and I came here in 2003 and was really amazed at the rich variety of CBOs and nonprofit organizations that are in this landscape, because they're among them, while there are really big ones that were nationally known and can do a lot of everything, there are also really small ones who have really strong niche sort of communities and um, work in within these various sort of um, fields, right, with, with really good expertise. So thank you for that question, Cindy. And, and yeah, I would say, um, I would, I would point you in that direction, barrier-free living, and also our family justice centers, um, because they are accessible and really try to individualize people's uh, supports according to their needs. Oops, sorry, sorry. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. And in terms of your um, family justice centers, just a follow-up question is whether, you know, as we think about coming back, you know, from this pandemic, and building back broader and more inclusively, um, and you may already have this in those centers, but um, having like uh, uh, assistive listening technology. So if someone who wears a hearing aid comes in, that they'll be able to, I, I don't know whether you already have that, but having loop technology so that they can communicate with the first person they talk to um, at, at the desk. It's something that we recently put in even to our community board for our meetings, um, but it, it can also be, it's in our taxis and that sort of thing. It seems to me that in these centers, if you don't have that technology, um, or maybe you do, but if you don't, um, if it's something that could be part of the conversation. Yeah, to my understanding, some of the offices are um, wired for that. Uh, mm -hmm. I know our headquarters is as well. Um, but again, we have other ways of providing um, accessibility to make sure that people can access the services, so yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And when we're open, if anyone ever wants to drop in and see it and meet the team, would love to. Thank you. I also had a follow-up question about elder abuse. Do you partner up with um, senior centers to let them know the signs and all those things and provide workshops? Because I think that could be another way of communicating with yeah. our elders that may not realize that they're going through elder abuse? Is that something that you offer that we could say, hey, we have senior centers that want to workshop? Yeah, and we, we, we've done a lot. We love working with our seniors. So not only do we do that, um, but we work with a, a big array of, par I keep saying array, and I, I need better words for this, variety <laughs> assortment of, um, you know, uh, people who uh, organizations that specialize in gender-based violence, as well as the city's own department for the aging. So um, we can do several things when it comes to senior centers. We can do our own programming. We also partner with DIFTA and they have something called the Grandparent Resource Center and they offer a lot of really cool services um, through theirs as well. Uh, we also work with organizations like SAGE and JASA and they, so if it's not something that we can provide, we all have partners that we can connect you to who do provide that. Um, one of my favorite senior, of, well, two of my favorite senior events that me and my team ever did in outreach, one of them was a, was a uh, intergenerational prom style event we did in Harlem at a senior, it was at a community center 
The community not only wanted to talk about gender-based violence, but they also wanted to bridge the gap between youth and seniors because they felt like they weren't really interacting a lot. So we planned a prom style event and we mixed like dancing and food. And um, the community was awesome at bringing all kinds of resources together, mixed with like little workshops in between the songs and activities to get people engaged. And the other thing that I really loved that we did at senior centers when we were able to do this kind of stuff, uh, we used to bring our karaoke machine and we used to do love song karaoke because the seniors love to sing karaoke, but in this, in between the songs, we would talk about the lyrics and really break down what was like healthy and unhealthy about the lyrics in the song. It ruined songs for some people, um, but that was a great way to talk about like abuse and healthy and unhealthy relationships and prevention um, without just doing a PowerPoint presentation and talking at people. Um, but again, we also have partners that do lots of cool programming. So um we we, tr we we try to get creative with it so those are the things that we do and then that's my outreach team we're sort of the community public facing we we work in community but our training team is responsible for training service providers across the city um and they also train like you know all kinds of city agency staff about all this stuff so yeah that's great, also great. something we do and can do thank you that sounds like lots of fun maybe we'll take you up on the karaoke ourselves uh, Joan? Uh, hi, and I thank you for, this was very, very educational. But whenever I hear of a story, I always think of the children that are involved in this, how it affects them. So, and it upsets me. How do you guys work around helping the children? Yeah. I'm glad you brought that into the space. So there's here's a couple things we do. Uh, number one, if somebody comes into one of our family justice centers, you'll notice in the area in the waiting area, the first thing you'll see is a children's room. So we have a children's room at every family justice center stocked with toys and snacks and art supplies, and it's staffed with licensed play therapists. So while the parent is getting support and is talking about all the things that they're experiencing, their child can wait in this safe area, right? And, and sort of receive attention. So that, that I just wanna mention that about our physical space, not to mention that a lot of our programming um, is geared towards survivors and their children. So for example, we have one program called, called the Brooke Jackman Foundation and they donate books and money. And on a weekly basis, we bring in survivors and their kids to read a book together and then have dinner. And it's a great place for them to like be safe and, and do something that has nothing to do with treatment or anything, their trauma, but just sort of be together and learn together and they get to go home, they get to take the books home. Um, and then in addition to that, we work really closely with uh, children's welfare, uh, ACS. Um, we provide children's services on site. Um, and we also make referrals to uh, people who specialize in supporting children through this. And then I talked earlier just now about our training team. They have a whole series of trainings that they do for service professionals, um, all the way from um, infancy, the effects of domestic violence on pregnancy, infancy, all the way to the effects of domestic violence on children. And they talk a lot about that. They talk about they talk a lot about the effects of trauma, um, you know, sort of, how children sort of experience that, uh, et cetera. So on both ends, I wanna say, yes, we are, we are really conscious to address not only um, in the service aspect of it, but in the training aspect as well. And um, it's part of the reason the city is rolling out more, more funded programs around family violence because people need more options than just ACS, right? In, in supporting their children and their family if they're experiencing gender-based violence. And the reason children in particular are such an important factor um, in, in the child, in, in looking at this from a child welfare perspective is because when you look at um, ACS cases, um, I think it's something close to 80% of those ACS cases uh, where there was a child fatality, there was domestic violence involved. 
right? So it, they're, they, they go, they're highly intertwined. Um, so it is something that we pay a lot of attention to in our office. Um, a child that is over 10 years old, say 11 or 12, what are the signs that there is domestic violence in his background or her background? Yeah. So I would say it depends on your relationship with the child. Uh, the most important thing you can look for is their, the changes in their behavior. But um, I'm going to throw out some signs, but I want to here now I'm going to preface it because I'm remembering to say it beforehand instead of after. I'm going to preface it by saying that none of these is an indicator. These are potential signs. They're not necessarily an indicator. So, you know, one of them uh, might be the child is missing a lot of school or not, not getting medical care, right? Because there might be things on their body that their parents don't want the doctor to see, or they don't want their teachers to know certain things. And so they don't go to school. Um, it could be a child who doesn't want to go home. Um, it could be, um, it could be like displayed in their behavior, but again, that depends on the child, right? So like, usually we, we've all heard that saying the squeaky, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So normally like children who act out are the ones that we kind of tend to look for, like as the ones needing help, like they're acting out for help. But sometimes it's the children who are very quiet and turn inwards who might be experiencing some sort of abuse at home and don't want to talk about it. Um, it could be, you know, they don't have a steady place to stay, um, you know, things like that, right? Like uh, same clothing every day. Um, they have bruising or injuries and their explanations for those injuries don't really seem to match up. Um, it could be that, right? Um, so there, there could be a lot of different signs. Um, but um, like I said, not not one of those in particular is necessarily an indicator for something definitely happening. I think you have to kind of look at the whole picture. Um, and uh, depending on your relationship with the family and the parent, uh, you know, try to find a way to talk to them safely about your concerns. Is bullying one of the symptoms? Bullying by other children? I, I would, I mean, I would say it might depend on the type of bullying, right? Like if you happen to overhear the kids saying like, you know, I'm bullying you because you're a, your parents, a, you know, hit each, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't necessarily connect bullying to them experiencing domestic violence at home. Are you saying if they are a bully themselves? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know necessarily. Like I said, each kid can manifest that experience, that traumatic experience, differently. Now, some of some people who experience that might themselves turn into abusive people. They might also turn into victims themselves. It could it could go either way, uh, okay. without yeah, okay. without actually like having a conversation with the child. I, I wouldn't be able to say off the bat where that particular behavior, I couldn't tell you like, yes, every kid that's bullying is experiencing domestic violence at home. I don't think that would follow, but worth looking okay. into. All right, thank you. Thank you, Joan, that was a great question. Cynthia Gonzalez. Yeah, my question um, relates to, <coughs> excuse me. My question relates to uh, what you were saying about the abuser, which I think formally we considered them perpetrators of abuse um, and the programs that you are trying to bring to those people. Um, when we were talking about the elderly, uh, what came to my mind was the fact that um, some of the people that are um, abusing the elderly, you know, family members or people close to them. Um, these are people that may be impacted with mental health issues, but the victim doesn't identify, you know, that connection. They don't, um, they don't necessarily see that 
the person may be having mental health issues that are causing the behaviors. Um, and even if they do recognize it, because mental health illness is such a, you know, it's a stigma uh, to the family, which a lot of people don't want to address or report or whatever. Now, I know that in formerly in the perpetrator program, unless you were court mandated, uh, you didn't have to attend. And in formerly in the perpetrator program, the perpetrator had to sort of like admit and confess to the fact that they are doing these behaviors to uh, you know, their family member. Um, but if the person is in denial of their abuse, um, how is that being addressed? That's a, that's a really deep one. I'm going to try to distill my answer as much as possible. But um, so first of all, um, I just want to explain why I'm using the term person causing harm. Um, number one, if I am working with a victim or survivor, I am going to mirror the language that they use. If they say abuser, I'm going to say abuser. If they say person causing harm, I'm going to say person causing harm out of respect for them. But the reason I person have made the personal decision in my regular conversations to say person causing harm is because I'm trying to take a holistic look at the issue and um, a more restorative approach to it. And I think that signifies my hope that people can change. However, not everybody can, right? I think for people who cause harm, they have to want to change. And not everybody, these programs, these voluntary programs are not for everyone. That's why there are court mandated programs. Um, and those, and part of the job of those mandated programs is to evaluate whether the person can change, right? What is their safety uh, risk? Um, so to be clear, some as it stands right now, there are no voluntary programs in the city. There are only court mandated programs. Um, they use the term perpetrator because that is a law enforcement term, right? That is that is what cops and DAs and attorneys say um, about a person causing harm. And depending on the identities people hold, that term perpetrator can be very triggering. Um, there are a lot of people who never want to engage in law enforcement as they're going through their gender-based violence experience, right? Um, also, it's, it's the perpetrator is a I think it's a term that's thrown around a lot, right? And, and even outside the realm of GBV um, when it's associated with crime and law enforcement. So I, I wanna call attention like perpetrator is a very law enforcement centered term. The other term that um, people used to use a lot is batterer, but what does batterer connote? Physical abuse, battery, right? And as we know, Gender-based violence is not just physical. It's so many other things. So I think the term batterer also doesn't properly capture um, the experience. Um, I know survivors who say, I say abuser because my ex, you know, is never gonna change and that's he's not sorry and that's just what he is. And I will use that term with them because I that's fine. Um, but there are a lot of people who are using and adopting the term person causing harm as they do more research and sort of understand where these abusive behaviors come from. They come from our society, patriarchy, rape culture. Um, you know, it comes from trauma, right? Um, it comes from a lot of different places. So I, you might hear me throwing around those different terms and that's just a little explanation about where that comes from. Um, but to, to your point, Cynthia, um, when it, okay, court mandated programs are mandated. People don't got a choice. If they don't go, they're in violation, right? Um, if they don't want to change, then there's their their sort of future trajectory looks a lot different from but someone the, who's saying. Excuse, excuse me, me, but in, in the, the past, past, if the if the, if the person, person causing, causing abuse, abuse um, did, didn't admit to it or didn't, or didn't recognize, recognize it, it, the program, the program wouldn't, wouldn't take, take them. them. I can't say specifically what program you're talking about. Um, programs have different structures. Some of them are about 
sort of acknowledging, they, they all work on different sort of models. Some of them use cognitive behavioral therapy. Back in the old days, they used to use anger management. Gender-based violence is not about anger management. So if it was if it was one of those programs, if somebody went to one of those types of programs back in the day, I can guarantee you it didn't work, right? Mm -hmm. Because those, those, to be quite honest, the old uh, batterers intervention programs, they were a joke. They were but a joke. But they wouldn't they even be accepted, accepted into the program, program unless they admitted, admitted to being a perpetrator. I can't speak, yeah, again, I, I don't know what specific program you're talking about and, and, and sort of what, how, what model it was using or what, you know, there's, a, there, there's several out there. I, I, some of them work differently. Some of them are about really breaking down your actions, right? Some of them are cognitive behavioral therapy based. Um, the old ones that don't work and were thrown out are the anger management ones, right? Um, so I, 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 ha I don't have enough information to be able to, I mean, I, I don't know. If you're saying that, then I, I believe you, but I, I don't know. No, I know, no, I know because, because as a social, social worker, worker, I had, had clients. clients. To give you an example, somebody who was a, a child predator, a child sex abuser, um, if they didn't admit to it, the programs just would not take them. I've never worked with child abuse programs, like programs for pedophiles, so I, I can't speak to that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a question? No, if no, not, not Jeremy, Jeremy I, I, did you get, get Sam and John Garcia, Garcia for attendance? I got John Garcia, Garcia and Sam, Sam Sierra, Sierra yes. yes. Okay. okay. Is there are no, no questions, questions from anybody? From anybody? We, wanna we want to thank, thank you for your presentation. It was very, very informative. informative. We'll definitely, we'll definitely be getting back, back to you and making connections with communities, communities with our community, community agencies, agencies to see how they can use the services. I know I learned a lot today as well as, as, well as the, the other members, members of the board. Of the board. So we thank, thank you for taking the time and getting us on this very important very issue. issue. And I look and forward to getting the statistics for CB in particular. Thank you so much for bringing me into this space and for bringing attention to this really important topic. It was great seeing some faces, some humans today. Um, I'm gonna follow up. Uh, I have Natasha's email, I believe. Um, and the general CB7 email. So I will follow up with the PDF of the, of the PowerPoint deck. Um, I'm also gonna send you some links on our website. Uh, so you have that. And of course, my email address, reach out anytime. And the two that they come up in other so yeah, I'll send you uh -huh. one of the links I'm going to send is to our materials page and it's got stuff in like 11 languages. Perfect. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Which isn't a lot in New York City, but it's something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. I hope everybody has a Thank good you. and safe night. Take care. So there's nothing, nothing further. further. The meeting the tonight, tonight is adjourned. Stay safe, everyone. And thank you for coming. Thank, thank you for you. having a meeting. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, Archie.